figure that is not marking off the gate refers to. The vast majority though are depictions at various levels of stylization, stylization of simple domestic objects. The cake, a pair of swimming trunks, a baby pacifier, car keys, a, do a dog, and so on and so forth. Despite, or perhaps because of their literalness, they're at first sight oddly equivocal and enigmatic. What does it mean, for example, to encounter in the small park near the, near the subway stop the image envelope? Or to suddenly come across this abstracted picture of a beach? What does this mean? Their meaning only becomes clear when one examines the reverse of each slide. Fixed below the slide, at the very bottom here, is a small plaque and then there is a text. The plaque and the text begin to offer a clue as to what these illustrations are about. The plaque gives the title and very importantly the subtitle of the project as a whole. Memorial, Places of Remembrance. I, by Richard's neighborhood. Isolation and deprivation of rights, expulsion, deportation, and murder of Berlin Jews in the years 1933 to 1945. The texts are extracts from one of the decrees that were applied to Jews in Berlin between 1933 and 1942. The one that you are looking at there reads, Jews are not permitted to leave their apartments after 8 p.m., 9 p.m. in summer, September the 1st, 1939. So for example, and the others are similar. The text on the reverse of the sign house reads, Jews may inherit only when national socialist morals are upheld. The sign bread, as on the reverse, Jews in Berlin are allowed to shop for food only between 4 and 5 o'clock in the afternoon, 4th of July, and seven, sorry, 4th of July, 1940. The text, therefore, for record, as each sign illustrates, sometimes literally, sometimes elusively, almost always with a degree of pathos, the net of persecutory prohibitions that between 1933 and 1942 eroded Jewish life, and increasingly set the community apart from their non-Jewish neighbors. The sign, this sign, for example, records the, the expulsion of children from the public schools. On the sign, seven o'clock is the visual side for the text you already saw about the curtain. Sign and text between them, you could say, at once make emblematic and represent both the objective evidence of the seemingly incidental legal and juridical processes by which the Jewish population was gradually deprived of all rights. It is indicative in this respect that the series opens not with a dramatic gesture, but with one of the first regulations passed by the Nazi city authorities, cost of treatment by a Jewish doctor after April the 1st, 1933, will not be reimbursed by the city of Berlin's public health insurance company, March the 31st, 1933. So they begin absolutely with the mundane, with the everyday, not with the dramatic. So the emphasis one realizes is not on the events of the Holocaust per se, only three or four of the signs actually refer to the Holocaust per se, as we now think of it, started in 1941-42 but on the daily humiliations and the cruelties that prepared the way for the Jews as victims to be, which later enabled their fate to this either both logical and necessary. Taken individually, some of these decrees may scarcely seem to matter, but they're not taken or delivered individually. What is of consequence is the range and cascade in accumulation of the edicts imposed. There were far more than the 80 which which Dia Schnapp worked around. And they covered, as is already implied, every single aspect of life down to the most mundane and particular. As to range, while some can be expected with the study of this project, others surprised, either because one had scarcely thought of this or activity as subject to regulation. For example, the sign book 
it refers to the regulation that Jews may not purchase books October the 9th, 1942, or because one is still reluctant to attest to a premeditated degree of petty cruelty imagined in even the simplest moments. So the image cat says, Jews are no longer allowed to have household pets, 15th of March, 1942. Occasionally one is almost sickened by the realization of what is to come. I remember one visit here when I suddenly came across this sign, which I'd not seen before, called uh, Hogscotch. And I thought, no, there can't be a regulation about children's play. How naive of it. Of course there was a regulation about children's play from 1938, which formally forbade um, Aryan and non-Aryan children playing together. But that also testifies to the limits of our own ignorance and the limits of our own imagination, our own naivety about the cruelty the Nazis were capable of. As I was giving this lecture last year, the year before, there was a sudden article in the, in the New York Times about a TV program which was all about, in the headline is priming Germans for the Holocaust. And one little point of this, which I didn't know previously, was the creation the Nazis had created the children's board game called Jews Out, where the person who won the game was the person who managed to persuade most Jews to emigrate. This was 1936 when they were still talking about the creation. I noticed above that the, the, the initial surprise in how few of the signs directly attest to the deportation and murder uh, or to what we assume is the markets in the process of rendering Jews as non-persons. There are some, especially after 1941, the sign factory, for example. I'm oh, sorry, I've got the wrong sign The sign factory, for example, denotes the edict from March 1941 that all adult Jews must do hard labor, and that of shirt that all Jews over the age of six must wear the double star. The black marker on here, um, refers to a de decree of the 23rd of October 1941 that the emigration of Jews is forbidden, while the, while the acronym DR, which stands for Deutsche Reichsbahn, stand which is for the German Railways, rail rail bears the double legend, first mass deportation of Berlin Jews October 18th, 1941, and first deportations directed to the death camp at Auschwitz July the 11th. What, but even while this escalation towards death was de developing, degrees of astonishing banality are still being issued. One, for example, as late as February 1942, Jews are forbidden from buying newspapers and magazines, or June 1942, and cigarettes and cigars are no longer sold to, 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 to Jews. The point, of course, it is precisely the fact that these lawful edicts reach into the most petty areas of life and bear with particular or peculiar force on the character of everyday life that they, seem in take, that they succeed in taking the Jewish population of Berlin out of society. The lesson that is the, the point that we get here is just the extent to which these d d d d decrees, as the artists themselves say, systematically force the Jews out of daily life and gradually rob them of their basic. The lesson that is born on, in on the spectator is that it is impossible not to perceive this deep intertwining between the lawful enactment, encouragement, and legitimation of petty cruelty and what is to come. Now, it's interesting that I think that today these little moments of petty cruelty might even strike us harder than they might have done a few years ago. I think to some extent because of the continuing barbarism of our times, because of things like almost like what we might call the Holocaust industry, towards the sort of escalation of sheer numbers where people we took five million, six million, we think of the millions of dead across the 20th century, we are almost inert in a way to the actualities of mass death. What now touches us, we realize, are those moments at which the political process kind of comes down to earth. So the side envelope, uh, which I showed you earlier, has its 
on its reverse side, one of the very, very few just pure personal stories which this project actually uh, deals with. Uh, the sign reads, um, the time has come, tomorrow I must leave, and naturally it is a heavy burden. I will write to you, this is just a statement, just before being deported, January the 16th. So this is the project, You've got a sense of the project. The question for us is, how does it work? And what lessons does it offer concerning design today? That's what we're going to try to look at, because I do think it has lessons. The first thing to say is that as one encounters it, the project works precisely in the way its authors or its designers say. If you read the bits in red, which are the important bits, this is a statement that they made on their website. Today, the words and images, sorry, together, the words and images force passers-by to remember the almost forgotten history of this neighborhood. By walking this, through the streets, the observer can relate to the way in which these regulations eroded basic human rights, instinctively questions about past and about present events evolve. I think, for once, this is where the artist's statement is completely, utterly correct. This is how it actually works out. Notice this last sentence, which I think is extremely important. Instinctively, questions about past and present developments involved. The, the idea that, which Constantine was opening to you about design as a process of asking questions, of creating things which provoke the question, either consciously or almost unconsciously. Now the work, let's look at the, how the work works. One of the first point might be to say how much it is linked to its con context, both Berlin as a whole and Schomburg district. Devastated through firebombing during the war, a picture from 1950 there shows the extent of the damage with demolition underway as a prelude to rebuilding. Today, the area around Bayerisha Platz is a comfortable, even desirable neighborhood. Some of it is rebuilt from the early 20th century architecture. Much of it is four or five story walk up walk apartments. Walking around it, one gets a strong sense of community tree lined streets, a church, shops, a children's playground. Both the memorial and the visitor feel as something of an intrusion into this company. World. But this is, of course, the, the point, and the second aspect of how the, work, how the memorial works. For the awkward, that, that is the necessary accompaniment to experience in this piece is wholly different to the sense that one experiences or feels that one should experience in relation to the standard war memorial. The latter, by almost by necessity, carves out for itself a quasi-sacred, or at least an unnotorific space. This is most obvious, in a, even in a secular sense, in the war graves of not more than France that come from the First World War. But it's a present as aura around every monument to the dead. But the Schoenberg Memorial is quite different. Though it's called and was ostensibly created as a memorial, it is in fact neither experience nor does it function as a monument in any traditional sense. It is in fact, this is the first of a number of deflations that the project manages, a kind of anti-monument, both in the extreme modesty of its means as compared to, say, Lubbock's great monument of the victims of the song. But also, from this perspective, what can be read, or what I can now read, as the rhetorical and even material excesses of, say, Daniel Liebsky's Jewish Museum in Berlin from 1998, or Peter Eisenman's slightly later monument in Berlin to the destruction of the European tourism. Instead of creating it as a space other to life, this project weaves itself into the fabric of a neighbor. You just fine. Put another way, we can say that counter to the logic of almost every other memorial of death, 
the Anishinaabe project insists on the continuity between what is memorialized or recollected in the present, not as memory of the attempt to hold in mind what was, but also as commentary on what is present. There's a very interesting slide which shows the NPD, which is the anti-immigrant quasi-fascist party in Berlin in recent elections, putting their own posters on top of sheets. So the connection to the present. The third indissolvable aspect of what creates the force of the short version of the memorial is the sheer the visual form it takes, or to put it better, the manner in which it visually and experientially organizes how we encounter it. Not for nothing are memorials traditionally rendered in that which would in As Victor Hugo has it in his reflections on printing and architecture in Notre Dame de Paris, at every moment when human memory has felt itself overlaid and in mind, he says, it seals itself and preserves its memory, memories and its relics beneath a monument. A visible monument, but above all durable. And for millennia, Victor Hugo says, the geological endurance of stone made it the natural material. So you make your memorial in order to endure. Here is stone energy. Easter Island, and even Bernini. Even the effort of working stone inscribed the traditional monument with a weight of human investment. One pays tribute in fact today as much to the act of its scripture as to what was inscribed. And even contemporary moment monuments continue this tradition, hence the fall back to neoclassicism in some of the worst and most trite memorials. This is the United States memorial to World War II in Washington. But it's even there, in the, re in the attempted reinvigoration of this tradition in Mamai Mayalin's Vietnam Veterans Memorial and in Peter Eisenman's Sea of Concrete Blocks, which is the sea. The Schoenberg Memorial has nothing whatever to do with this tradition. In the Schoenberg piece, the items are simply brightly colored printed metal images, 80 of them, distributed around the streets of a neighborhood. What one encounters are very simple images and living, derived from watercolor and acrylic or originals, almost childlike in their simplicity, as I've said, they evolved for me a child's reader. But they're obviously not, in their sight, simply illustrations. They are enunciative, even if it's not clear at first what it is they are announcing. Now, when one realizes what's going on here, attention naturally begins to focus on the text. But if the text, the extracts from the decrees are the message, the effect of the piece is by no means, of course, the same as simply reading the list of regulations and orders. It is one thing to read these regulations, shocking as some of them are in their banality and petty cruelty, and quite another to discover them re reproduced on the reverse of an image hung on a lamppost in a pleasant Berlin suburb. This one is an edict which forbids Jews from purchasing Russian go -go goods, which virtually means at that point the remaining Jews must have purchased stuff. Death. But what I always notice here is the contrast between this message and the geraniums in the window box of right. It is different to read this message in this context. This is the most interesting thing. For example, if you encounter the sign for the expropriation of Jupiter. And one does indeed, one of the other aspects of this, trying to visit this memorial, is that one does in fact discover the, the green dots on this map represent the sighting of the various signs. You will see that they are maybe 100 meters, maybe 200 meters apart. There is a cursory center to the, model, to the monument, which is the Bayerische Platz. But with only two or three images to a street, one walks the surrounding 
treats with almost no sense of when or if you will find the signs, even on repeated visits, one never sees all, all of them. And at times it can seem as if the signs go on in an almost endless profession, so that it becomes easy to imagine them distributed across the entire city, and not across Germany as a whole. And this is a side effect which I think the artists doubtless welcome and this sense that they're just going to go on the inevitable stuff. And the effect of the, this encounter, or one can only call it that, is all the stranger, because how on an most immediate level one first comes across the, the images. As I think maybe you've already picked up, as one finds them, one is at a loss at first to actually account for them. Lying between the literal and the, the enigmatic, but always staying this side of emotional expression, they have this kind of deadpan quality. What is puzzle? What is going on here? What is this? What does this chunk of wall mean? It actually meant that Jews are responsible for paying for the repair to the synagogues that were damaged during crystal men. What does this mean? eventually work out from the side of the other that it's a theater curtain and it refers to the edict uh, which bans Jewish actors and actresses. But this kind their kind of non-engagement with any overt emotion produces an engaged puzzlement. Later one realizes that they are in this sense the equivalent, though not identically so, if very importantly, of the prosaic matter of fact of the regulations themselves. They have something of the same quality. They are a concentration of the regulations. They are not simply literal illustrations. Thus, the, some of them are ironic. There's this sign at right here, which translated means sort of good welcome in German. Welcome in the best sense of the word. But what it refers to is the edict that was sent out during the Berlin Olympics of 1936, which said, quote, to avoid giving foreign visitors a negative impression, signs with strong language will be removed. Signs such as Jews are unwanted here will suffice during the 29th, 1936. So this sign is deliberately ironic. Well, while even the sign I showed you earlier, Jewelry, which is almost literally ostensive and kind of pointing to its subject, is still sort of emblematic, like most of the signs, it points to a segment of life, but it takes a slightly elliptical stance, and this gives the visual signs a kind of certain independence <coughs> of vitality. They're not expressive of life, they are emblematic. And, and very important here too is, I think, the sense of human involvement, which is heightened by the lack of finesse. They're somehow too crude or too naive to be armed in a certain way. And the fact that there is a non, not quite a literal transposition between regulation and illustration means there is, there is a kind of wavering, a zone of uncertainty that is only resolved by actually reading and pondering the regulation pointed on the reverse side. So the, the too crude, in a way, to be armed, and this one's forced to sort of ponder what could be happening here, to begin to engage. There is not simply a literal position. Now what I think all this does is actually to create what I would call here, that the whole project should be thought of as a certain kind of, a strange kind of poetic project, a sort of poetry degree zero. But it creates a space, I would argue, in which understanding can emerge. This understanding is not a kind of restitution. It's rather an understanding which at once seeks to make suffering and humiliation concrete in specific sen senses, and seeks an end to the abstraction of the event itself, the abstraction of the, of the Holocaust. Now this is very important, I think, on both sides. First of all, almost no other Holocaust memorial that I know actually deals with the material suffering of the Jewish population before they were taken off to the camps. You see, when you think about it, a lot of the Holocaust memorials kind of, if you like, sort of presume the death, deaths. And you, one is left assuming that things just <coughs> were, and then suddenly people were shipped off. And it actually wasn't like that. It was this years, these. It took, in fact, 
night, get beers to prepare the ground. Nine years of privation, humiliation. And the, I think the, this project, one of its great virtues is that it deals with that. The second thing is that in dealing with this, it reminds us of what we want, often want to forget, that suffering at a mass scale is always the product of an entire series of previous steps and decisions made, the interruption of any one of which might have had a considerable impact on whether the project, which in this case the extermination of the European Jews, was actually re realized. And this in turn links back to the second aspect of the project, which is vital, in that it reminds us that the Holocaust was a political project through and through, not a tragedy that was somehow inevitable. Arant had it exactly when she used the term banality, say the banality of evil, a famous commentary. So this memorial and its decrees confirms Arant's thesis. What it tells us is that this was indeed a political project designed to take out its part of the population. It's also worth remembering that the Jewish population of Germany as a whole was less than 1% of the Jews. The Jews were vulnerable in terms of the size. By about after a waves of early Jewish immigration, there was a fragment of over half a million Jews left in, as against 67 million of the German population. So an easy minority. So what does this achieve? What does the what does the, uh, uh, the whole process achieve? First of all, something that we've seen already in both the instances that Constantine gave you last week, and they say the instances that I gave you of design and innovation, the underground, the mini skirt, the mini car, all of the astonishing economy of gesture. So, in a way, the gesture that makes the world its light, it manifests a dead touch. But this leads to a very peculiar paradox in the case of the, um, the, uh, of the, the, the Berlin project. The project is, on the one hand, infinitely smaller in architectonic Petrol volume, or in expense, by the way, than the larger, more visible Holocaust memorials. And yet its extent is infinitely greater in terms of the geographic area of Berlin that is covered by it. It is much larger. It implies this city in some ways. So there is this very interesting contrast here between these two moments. I would say that against the lightness of touch which the Schoenberg Memorial offers us, the formal gestures of Liebstein and the monumentality of Eisenman look overwrought and also strangely empty of content. The second thing which is achieved, and it's the human achievement, is that the memorial disturbs the character of victim, the category of victim. <laughs> I want you to, this statement has haunted me ever since I read it in an interview with Saul Barrow, when he talks about being a child, being with his mother in a Chicago theater, 1945-1946, seeing newsreel film of the bodies piled in the concentration camps, and his mother coming out of the summer and saying to him, how will we Jews ever live down the shame? The way that the victim takes on the shame of being the victim. And this is, of course, a huge problem. It's a huge contemporary problem for us. Traditional monuments don't help because they actually register the dead as one way or the other victims. The problem with the category of victims is that victims are very close to non-persons. Victims are seen as the passive opposite of will. 
by definition. To be a victim is to be shamed or very close to But by reconstructing how, in this case, victims became so, the Berlin Memorial, in my view, re-establishes the Jewish victims of the, of the Holocaust less as passive objects before inexorable fate, and more as subjects, and this is, I think, very important, legally manufactured to be murdered. Less. Thirdly, I think that the, the work is a kind of measure that it internalizes history and the causes of history within itself. So it doesn't make an external reference to history. It embodies that history within itself. Inside it. Yeah. And at the same time, it provides a measure. Now, it is madness to compare this project to the London Underground Diagram. Yet the London Underground Diagram, what does it do? It makes comprehensible and accessible what is almost incomprehensible in reality. And it does it through offering us a model form that we can get hold of. I think the Berlin Project is doing something very similar. It is taking what is almost incomprehensible, the like Holocaust, and modeling it in a quasi-diagrammatic form, which means that we can get hold of it. What is key here, though, isn't just simply the specific understanding that the work offers, although that's really extremely important to bring us back to these material conditions of the everyday day, that central. But it insists tacitly, the work insists that it is capable of offering understanding. In other words, it says, look, we can, you can comprehend this incomprehensible act. It is not an abstraction, an unknowable entity that we are doomed possibly to repeat because we do not know it, we can grasp it, shall we say, cognitively. So that's important. So the piece is in fact, in the end, less in my view a memorial than it is a means for looking at history. And this seems to be to be linked in to a whole tendency within design now, which is designing not to get X, but precisely for looking at. Finally, there is the question of praxis, the action that arises or is capable. The concluding sentences of Theodono's, Adorno, Theodono Adorno's essay, The Meaning of Working Through the Past, wrote as follows. The past will have been worked through only when the causes of what happened have been eliminated. Only because the causes continue to exist and does the captivating spell of the past remain to this day unbroken. But for this to occur, the past has to be confronted in a way that allows cause to become a bit visible. And this depends crucially on the matter on the way in which the past is made present, whether it is left as a reproach, as I think it is in most traditional monuments, or as that which can be made and for the state, state of the state of the victims must be comprehended. So it's, it's a little bit similar to Brecht's notion. Criticism to do more than whining must make a diagnosis. One of the great Now, to, to be sure, the Schoenberg Memorial wants to keep very much alive the human tragedy of the Holocaust, but not as a tragedy, rather as a specific political event. To, to do this, rather than reproducing the past as is, it reconstitutes it. It thinks cause. And in so doing, it suggests that if we can do this, if we can make an event that can take on the conditions of historical murder, then might we not find our way back to forms of active that are less reactive, that are more kind of affirmative in, in terms of the nihilisms of the present. The philosopher Zizek has recently claimed that the retroactivity of a gesture which reconstitutes our understanding of the past is the most succinct definition of what an authentic act is. In our own reactivity, we effectively just follow the coordinates of our identity. He could say the historical coordinates of our identity. Well, an act proper is the paradox of an actual move which retroactively changes the coordinates of its agent's being. Now, what Zizak is getting at here 
is that we are not simply determined by the past, we are determined by our history. But this history, Zizek is saying, is not fixed. It's not absolute. Because it is history is always a story, story, stories that we tell about ourselves. So what Zizek is saying, in effect, is that to rethink this is extremely powerful. That this actually can be that we actually then, at this point, start to think, if you like, what is determinism in us, and we begin to decide what will determine us. That's a nice, interesting argument on this. It's problematic, but it's worth pursuing. And acts of this type, he goes on to by, not only posit new realities, they change the conditions under which we act. They are, in a deep sense, the acts that give us essential degrees of freedom in all the space. So what we have here then is a kind of gesture which is ultimately a kind of measuring, meaning a measuring of our existence and also addressed to the urgent conditions of our history. How design intervenes in this is by creating new kinds of apparatus. We could have a whole lecture about apparatuses we mentioned earlier, about the apparatuses that today determine us. This is really an example of constructing an alternate apparatus that both does and sees. So the work functions, whether we're talking about a photograph, a diagram, a memorial, doesn't really matter, the work does something, but it also acts as a lens through which things, past, present, future, and in this case, at extreme, the nature of how evil can be enacted, can be seen and understood di differently, and in ways that can devolve directly on our capacity to act as political citizens. Now, it's this, then, that takes us back, and takes us back to what Constantine was talking about critical in the sense of commentary and judgment. And that commentary and judgment is dealing with the urgent situation with which we're faced. It has a nice push between conventional and critical design. And the points by Donald Graeby that for design, in order to not simply end up as sophisticated entertainment, that it has to identify and engage with complex and challenging issues. Basically saying the future would benefit from a more gritty view of human nature and an ability to make abstract issues tangible, which is what, of course, design has. This is that exactly what the, what the Schomburg Memorial does. It makes an abstract issue tangible and deals precisely with this. Dealing with what is dark, dealing with the dark side as well as the light side, if you say. Fully engaging and designing for the complexities of human nature, which is of course not always nice. And then notice Don and Ray's last point, when they're saying, is there a kind of work art? And they insist, no, it's not art. It might borrow heavily from art in terms of methods and approaches, but that's it. We expect art to be shocking and extreme. Critical design needs to be closer to the everyday. That's where its power to disturb comes from. Now, one of the reasons that I picked the Berlin Monument to deal with is precisely, of course, but it is dealing with every day, and in fact with artifacts and with objects. And objects today seem, we'll see it for many of you, necessarily kind of old-fashioned. They belong to a past, they belong to the kind of industrial, the manufactured past. The problem is that the immaterial society, the screen, that the screens, if you like, can also be an evasion of the materiality of our world. I forget the tons of materials that it takes to make a single laptop. Come, come, uh, 
um, and which I think is about 17 times more material than everyone. So the dematerialized society is not. There is a way in which artifacture is still, in a certain, certain sense, central to that, and is perhaps central to human beings. Here's the most interesting and powerful, the single most interesting line in Elaine Scarry's reading that you have on the interior structure of the artifact, which is a really interesting proposition. Achieving an understanding of political justice may require that we first arrive at an understanding of making and unmaking. Why? Precisely because, as the Schoenberg Memorial point hit out, one way to unmake a person is to unmake their relationship with things. Conversely, we are persons in part by our engagement through things which sustain us, enable us indeed. So there is a far more intimate relationship between making and unmaking, it, and it's at extreme moments like the Holocaust that we actually kind of set, or the, sorry, the, the kind of uh, moment that the Berlin uh, Memorial is dealing with, that one sees this at it. And this all links together towards, oh yes, sorry, this is a lovely slide on material death privation. Um, this is Bergman's film, Fanny and Alexander. I don't know if any of you know the story, but basically the mother of the two children here had left. Her husband dies. He's a theatre producer, director. He dies relatively young, leaves her with two children. She's rather beautiful. She gets seduced here by the big, big, big issue figure who eventually persuades her to marry him. Uh, but his condition after they're married is that she and the children come to his and live in his house and they can bring nothing with them whatsoever from their previous life. And this is, of course, an act of astonishing tyranny. The film enacts this tyranny, which is actually grounded so much on simple death activation. So, but what Sky is making here, you see, is a relation between justice making and persons whose corollary is injustice unmaking and un Unpersons. Now, Scully's other point is that when we are making, particularly when we are designing, we are making from a basic human observation about the conditions of our embodied nature, our sentience. So she has this lovely proposition here that the shape of a chair is not the shape of a skeleton, the shape of a bodywork, or even the shape of a pain perceived, but the shape of perceived pain wish gone. The chair is therefore the materialized structure of a perception in its sentient awareness materialized into a freestanding design. There you have an astonishing little statement which sums up a whole chunk of ethics of design. That design starts not even from the perception of a sentient condition, but the, the wish that that sentient condition be, in, if it is pain, alleviated, or if it is possibility, then realized. And so the materialized structure of a perception is that I could do something about this condition and I will translate it into an artifact that can indeed relieve pain or which can enable this positive ability. So this links, of course, to the idea of questioning our material things. But it links through to the question of how we relate between material human needs and the mode of answering them. Because entering into this material relation are, of course, social re re relations. We're seeing this right now in Obamacare. This is why this is such a remarkably relevant example. We have material human needs. 
they can be satisfied in an enormous variety of ways. The question is, how, how, how do we form them? How do we organize them? How do we shape them? What are the implications of shaping them in ways A, B, C, D, E, F, G? What, what are the differences? A society in which forms A are dominant might be completely different to a society in which forms E are different, for example. Just as Obamacare is at least intended to make a tiny inflection in, in the way of this. The example I gave you, um, the little example of the birthing center is a very nice little case study of this. What the birth center project by Barbara Marx seeks to do is to try to redefine the physical conditions under which giving birth might happen. To break it from the notion of hospital and therefore a patient, a person who is coming in to give birth as fundamentally a patient, which means basically an object to be processed, and transforming that into where you see the birth act not as a kind of medical condition, but as a perfectly natural human condition, which is not confined to the mother, but links to her, links to her family, etc., etc., etc. So what birth, what Barbara Marx does is to try to redefine or to indicate how one could have a different kind of birthing center this more, more intimate. It, it would have the sense of living room, kitchen where families live. The primary medical agents would, would be midwives, not the doctors. There is provision for children, and so on and so on and so on. It is the attempt then to kind of reconfigure human relations through the physical now what we're getting to here then is the relation between designing capabilities and capabilities of persons. We could start off working through this cycle we've just done, where we be where we begin from critical questions, the kind of George Pellet or George Nelson questions constantly. We move from these to the kind of perception that Elaine Stanis talking about. We utilize the design capabilities for translation of into an artifact that could work on behalf. That this artifact then has a series of configurative capabilities which enable it to work. And these capabilities are, in the long run, addressed to the capabilities of the subject to act. Think of the London Underground aircraft, for example. It's really an address to our capabilities to act. It's order to actually kind of, in a sense, to give us, in some ways, the confidence that we have the capabilities to navigate the underground system, etc. So even in small ways, it's So that's the connection that in the next two or three weeks, try and amplify this connection, show how it can resonate out in wider and wider dimensions. Otto will start to talk about this in more di directly in terms of design capabilities, and then I'll take it up in a wider sense, starting to look towards the anthology. That will be the Tuesday, that lecture will be the Tuesday after Otto's next Thursday lecture, because we move the Thursday classes to the Tuesday during the Thanksgiving week. The lecture after that is then the lecture by Mary Copanico from the Dharma and she'll be dealing with something very similar. Okay, thank you.